Our next speaker is Dr. Kate Dwyer. Dr. Dwyer is a research riparian ecologist with the USDA Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Fort Collins, Colorado, and an affiliate faculty at Colorado State University and the University of Wyoming. Research interests include the influence of prescribed and natural fire on riparian areas, the distribution of wetland and riparian plant species in relation to physical variables and disturbance, both natural and anthropogenic, and in-stream large wood recruitment processes. Dr. Kate Blyer. Well, one thing about going last is that many of the speakers, both yesterday and today, have touched on uh, quite a few of the topics that I'll be discussing. Uh, briefly, I'll be talking about fire history, properties, and fire behavior in riparian areas, post-fire processes, and recovery along streams, uh, particularly large wood recruitment and the role of, of riparian condition in, in, um, in stream large, uh, recruitment of in stream large wood following fire, the influence of herbivory on post fire recovery, the role of invasives and the importance of species traits, and fuel management treatments in riparian areas and, and kind of finalizing with the role of uh, fire and fuel management in, um, in future management of riparian areas. Uh, I want to, before I dive into those topics, I want to emphasize that riparian areas are highly diverse. Yesterday, Gene Chambered showed a nice slide of the elevational gradient of Great Basin plant community types um, along an elevational gradient, and this is a similar slide for the Front Range of Colorado, um, starting at higher elevations in alpine tundra, moving into um, forest alpine, subalpine forest along tree line into montane and mountain uh, coniferous forests and into uh, foothill shrublands and then into um, short grass prairie. And I, the, my point is that along it, within each one of these different forest types, the riparian areas and riparian plants are also changing. So everything that I'm going to say regarding riparian areas and fires um, really depends on the physical context and where that riparian area occurs in the watershed and in the stream network. Uh, a number of talkers, uh, doc, or, uh, speakers, um, Jack talked about uh, fire history and, and properties. Um, fire ecologists over the last couple of decades have, have uh, taught us a lot about, about fire uh, by investigating fire return intervals. But the um, reconstructing, reconstructing um, riparian fire frequencies uh, or history is challenging for a number of reasons. First, there's methodological constraints, uh, frequent um, natural disturbances, including uh, frequent flooding and debris flows. Also, there is the litany of um, of riparian abuses or alterations that have occurred to riparian areas, including grazing, beaver removal, logging, mining, flow alteration. And these cumulatively have, have um, resulted in a limited understanding of natural fire dynamics in riparian areas, including historic range of variability. And also many riparian areas um, have been understudied. And there are discrepancies in the published information. Um, a way to think about this is to consider the fire environment triangle. This is a concept proposed by Steve Pine and others in the classic book, Introduction to Wildland Fire. Um, if we consider, and, and this fire environment triangle uh, points out that fire is driven by three interacting factors, fuels, weather, and topography. The two of these physical factors, weather and topography, are frequently different in riparian areas. Whether um, considering riparian areas, they frequently have higher relative humidity, uh, lower temperatures, and this this microclimate can influence fire beha fire behavior as fire moves along uh, along streamside areas or within within stream corridors. Also, topography. Um, Riparian areas are the lowest point on the landscape, frequently you have different geomorphology than surrounding uplands, and this can also influence fire behavior. Another physical feature is the presence of surface water and saturated soils. Um, and this, uh, this can frequently influence fire behavior. Fires are known to move around 
uh, riparian meadows to uh, to also skirt uh, willow dominated riparian areas and to skip over riparian wetlands due to due to the um, moisture features. In fact, fire managers frequently would use riparian areas to assist in fire suppression strategies. The third part of the fire triangle is, is fuel, and frequently riparian areas differ in vegetation characteristics relative to uplands, and this means their fuel characteristics also differ. So biomass is different, both density, size distribution, chemistry and, and foliar moisture content, ratio of live to dead, uh, continuity, horizontal and vertical, and this really translates to differences in ladder and surface fuels. So this, this table summarizes the handful of studies that have investigated fire return intervals in forested riparian areas. There are examples primarily from the Pacific Northwest, uh, with one example from California. And if we consider the averages, For the uh, dry forest type, the riparian areas burn with about the same frequency as the, the adjacent side slopes. For the mesic forest, however, the riparian areas burn a little less frequently. Um, a, in addition, uh, fire severity in riparian areas has been reported to be less. However, some riparian areas, uh, in, including many examples probably from the Great Basin, do burn like Uplands, and this is an extreme example of uh, intermittent or um, yeah, uh, uh, intermittent stream in eastern Nevada. Um, other areas where the riparian or the the um, small stream side area has burned just like the upland, and other examples of this include headwater systems in mountainous environments or areas where the riparian vegetation is really similar. Um, in moisture conditions and, and vegetation to the uplands. Now I'm going to move into post-fire processes uh, and recovery. And the example that I'm going to describe is, is a fire effects study, an ongoing fire effects study in Little Granite Creek. Little Granite is uh, on the Ridger Teton National Forest. It's a tributary to the Hoback River, uh, part of the Snake River system. And it burned in 2000. A uh, portion of the watershed burned in 2000, Boulder Creek watershed. The, uh, the red line here is the perimeter of the Boulder Creek fire. And directly following the fire, we established 100 meter reaches, um, half kilometer apart, systematically placed. And I'll be describing some of the information from each of these. Briefly, the upper three reaches were severely burned. These two reaches were moderately burned, and then the lower, the downstream, uh, five downstream reaches were not burned. And in this, as, as part of this study, we monitored the post-fire recruitment and transport of large wood. Um, within each of these reaches, we tagged and measured all pieces of, of wood that was entering the stream following the fire. And the example that I'll be describing in detail is from this upper severely burned reach. Uh, you can see from the topo map, it has a relatively wide valley bottom and it's a forested riparian area. The, um, the species are, it's primarily lodgepole with some large Engelman spruce right along the stream. And the, although the, the um, um, valley bottom is wide, it's mostly, it's mostly terrace with some, some floodplain. So in, in the, these are uh, diagrams of, of the surveyed reaches, of, of, or the reaches, the first and one reach, the, a severely burned reach, um, first and second year post-fire, and the, the pieces you see here are the pieces of, of large wood. And this, um, what's shown here is really fairly typical of uh, large wood loading for a stream this size, and you can see little change. This essentially represents the pre-burn amount of wood in the stream. But this changed quite a bit over time. Uh, this is the seventh, these two show the seventh and eighth post-fire years. Um, and in the seventh post-fire year, the amount, the number of pieces, and the volume of large wood more than tripled. And in the eighth year post-fire, more pieces continue to enter the stream. 
the advantage of this type of information, it's, it's a hard to get, but it allowed us to estimate rates of large wood recruitment from the riparian area. So in considering um, what we can learn from this, well, we are sort of back of the envelope um, calculations for the, the, the uh, sort of extent of recruitment was approximately 10 years. That was based on the rates, that the, the annual rates of large wood inputs to the stream, and then also the condition of the riparian area, just what was left in terms of um, number of pieces standing that could still enter the stream. So for this stream, um, most of all of the wood that would be entering the stream for this particular fire event was about 10 years. But we can gain a lot just by um, combining the information from each of those reaches with just information that's available on a topo map. For the three upper Upper reaches, the severely burned reaches, with relatively wide valley bottoms, forested riparian area, um, all of the in-stream large wood was coming from the riparian area. And the, the loading was, was, very, um, was very heavy. In these, um, these lower reaches, reach 31 and 26 were moderately burned, but the stream flows against the east hill slope here in the riparian area to the west is willow dominated, so the in-stream large wood, wood source was the hill slope, which again can be predicted given the, um, the characteristics of the hill slope forest. The lower reaches, um, 21 and, and 16, received large wood pieces that were transported from the burned area, so they were being augmented um, by the um, burned wood that was entering the stream from, from uh, the burned area. But the three lowest reaches really appear to be um, not influenced by the fire in terms of their large wood dynamics. Along, as part of the same study, we monitored post-fire recovery of riparian shrubs uh, in, in transects that were established perpendicular to the stream. And in this graph, the mean height, crown area, and crown volume is shown for six common riparian species, um, service berry, twin berry, um, buffalo berry, and three willow species. And the thing to note is, uh, this is data for the uh, second and third post-fire year, is that there is very little growth. Just all of these, uh, no difference indicate very little growth um, during that time period. These shrubs were heavily browsed, and this reflects the influence of herbivory on shrub growth. And this is similar to what Annie Lucen uh, reported yesterday for Aspen. We also observed new plants in the transects, uh, that is, new species that were added uh, with, our, with successive sampling um, over time. And the point of this is that it takes some plants a number of years to re-sprout following fire. So this is sort of a, a warning for fire effect studies that report mortality after um, just a few years, because many of these um, species or many individual plants may take longer to re-sprout. Also note that the three years post-fire were extremely dry years, and, and this has also been reported by others. Slower recovery in low precip years. Uh, yesterday, Duncan Patton mentioned the importance of species traits, and I'd like to, for um, restoration of southwestern riparian areas, and I'd like to reiterate that for the post-fire recovery of riparian shrubs in mountain environments. Many willow species uh, sprout vigorously from surviving root crowns following fire, as do many of the berry species, um, including twinberry, the ribe species, um, and buffalo berry, and others. Oops. Uh, many riparian species are also clonal sprouters, cl um, sprouting from rhizomes and stem bases, and this includes a number of species um, in the rose family, rosa species and spireas. And Duncan also mentioned the importance of riparian seed bank, and I, I would like to propose that this is also probably an important mechanism, not, not studied, but an uh, important mechanism for post-fire recovery in riparian areas. The dependence of many Ceanothus species on fire for germination is well documented. 
there's no published information for wild hollyhocks and some of our other native forbs, but I would propose that there are a number of fire-dependent species, and these are not restricted to riparian areas, but do very well in riparian areas following fire. Many herbaceous species also sprout vigorously after following fire. This is true of, of most carrot species, most of the sedges. Uh, unless the fire burns too hot, there are also cases um, largely undocumented, but a lot of anecdotal information about fires burning too hot in meadows or riparian areas uh, that are dominated by these species. Um, if the fire actually penetrates the organic rich soils, it can kill these below ground structures. But if the fire moves through fairly quickly, sedges are some of the first species to resprout following the fire. And these below ground structures are, are also what make these species so valuable for stream stabilization. So in considering uh, species traits, I'm, I'll, I'll move on to the role of fire and invasive plants in riparian areas. And th this is an area where I, I would love to have a model like the one that Dean just uh, described to you be applied to some of the, the issues of um, invasive species in riparian areas. By way of background, riparian areas are extremely susceptible to invasion. This is for a number of reasons. Stream networks or corridors for the recruitment of propagules. There are um, generally higher uh, resources or more resources are available, uh, light, water, and nutrients in, re in, uh, in riparian areas. Also, the um, periodic flow-related flow disturbance creates open space and creates and maintains a lot of habitat heterogeneity along streams, which allows the opportunity for, for multiple species to coexist, both native and non-native. And then the litany of human-caused disturbances that have brought a lot of invasive species to uh, riparian areas, including roads, um, flow alteration, grazing, um, and proximity to existing plant, uh, uh, non-native plant populations. I'll also note that uh, many riparian areas have been invaded. Um, Non-native woody species are very common and abundant, especially in low gradient, larger river systems throughout the West. And, and this, um, the, the first species that come to mind are tamarisk and Russian olive, but there, there are many others, tree of heaven, East, um, Asian elm, and, and other species. Also, invasive, invasive herbaceous species uh, are, are very prevalent in many riparian areas, and this includes uh, a number of the species that Dean just mentioned, the non-native roams, thistles, uh, star thistles, um, rush skeleton weed, Dalmatian toad flax, etc. They, they commonly occur in riparian areas, and they're frequently bigger, and uh, have extensive stands because, again, of that resource availability. This is a conceptual model put together by Matthew Brooks that shows the feedback mechanism between um, non-native plants, how they affect the fuel profiles or fuel structure, how that influences the fire regime, and then the feedbacks that that causes. Um, the strength of the arrow indicates the, the strength of the, the relationship or the influence on the system, and this continuing cycle is um, probably operating or, or, or can be applied to the cheap grass fire cycle in many Great Basin systems, which would also likely apply to um, riparian areas in Great Basin systems. But it can also be applied to the tamarisk example. Um, this is a photo that shows a uh, killed overstory cottonwood, which was killed by fire. Again, this is the importance of species traits. This is Fremont cottonwood. Duncan mentioned yesterday that this is not one of the uh, popular species that resprouts. The understory is tamarisk dominated, and tamarisk is. Uh, has the potential to produce large amounts of understory biomass that's highly flammable and can really work to alter the, the fire regime in riparian systems where it is dominant. If we move to the Great Basin, uh, this is a, a state and transition model that was generated from some work that was done by, by Wright and Chambers in the Toyabe Range of central Nevada. 
and it shows the interaction between fire management and species composition. Uh, the researchers seeded and burned plots that were located in areas with known water table elevation. The, the, the um, areas were known to have either high, intermediate, or low uh, water tables. And based on the results, they derived this model and show that a native dry meadow type has a potential to convert to Artemisia with a drop in the water table when it's coupled with overgrazing and lack of fire. With, with wildfire, however, uh, and proper grazing, the native raminoid community can be maintained, but with an additional drop in the water table, the type conversion can occur, uh, which is not recoverable without considerable active restoration. So this is an example of how fire management might interface with riparian management. My final topic is uh, riparian fuel treatments as, as restoration projects. And fire management, including both wildland fire use and fuel reduction treatments, has been recognized as an uh, increasingly important component of riparian management. However, it's an area where the state of the, the practice is, is way above the state of the science. We, there's actually very little work done on the, the impacts of fuel management treatments in riparian areas. And there's um, a number of, of other constraints on doing them. Riparian zones are protected by a lot of administrative um, rulings and, uh, and they also harbor a number of uh, listed species. So there's, there's certain fisheries and, and wildlife concerns. Uh, also, cultural um, sites are frequently located along riparian areas, in particular in, in the Great Basin. Um, many archaeological sites are, are located along streams. So there's a, a number of constraints that, that are sort of imposed on the ability to do fuel reduction treatments in riparian areas, and yet people are doing them. And this, this is basically a, a summary of a survey that was conducted to document the extent to which riparian fuel treatments are being conducted on Forest Service lands in 11 western states. So fire management officers from 55 national forests were contacted and asked a series of questions about the fuel reduction treatments that they're doing on their forests. Um, and the results are that for the most part the treatments were very small in size, only about 20% were over 300 acres. The treatment target was not usually the riparian area. In almost 60% of the cases, the riparian areas were included as large, part of a larger project. And this is one of the ways that fire management officers are managing, or and, and fuel specialists are managing to get some fire into riparian areas. They're allowing fires that, fire projects that are being conducted in the uplands to backburn into riparian areas. The treatment location is usually in the wildland urban interface, the, and most of the projects have multiple management objectives. I'll just go through a, a couple of case studies, riparian fuel treatments. Uh, this, is a this is fairly common mechanical thinning in tamarisk dominated areas. Again, about 69% of the respondents um, are doing mechanical thinning. It's frequently com uh, combined with prescribed burning with multiple objectives, reduction of fuel, control of invasive species, and protecting infrastructure. Also prescribed burning, this is uh, the, a series of photos that shows a prescribed burn on the Bridger Teton National Forest along Fontenelle Creek. The project ob objecti objectives were to enhance wildlife habitat and regenerate those decadent willows. There's not only decadent sagebrush, there's decadent willows too. And so that was the objective of, of this project. Unfortunately, there was no monitoring on this project. It was a spring burn that, that did go almost exactly how they had hoped it would, and it has regenerated very well. Uh, another fairly common type of fuel treatment is uh, control of woody encroachment of a meadow. We heard about this about encroachment yesterday. This is uh, the native species here that's moving in, that's not where it's supposed to be, is, uh, is lodgepole pine invading a dry meadow in uh, central Oregon. And uh, this again is, is a fairly common uh, riparian fuel treatment it, to control woody encroachment into areas that managers feel should remain open, should remain meadows. Again, that one did not have any monitoring either. 
So uh, future directions of how to integrate uh, fire and fuel treatment in, into riparian management. Uh, more integration is needed, but I suspect that more and more uh, managers will be considering, considering manipulating fuels in riparian areas as, uh, as restoration practice. Um, I would like to see an increased focus on plant species requirements and plant species traits, both of natives and non-natives, in considering and planning um, projects such as these. Um, also, um, in, in recovery predictions and improved integration of physical and biological processes uh, including large wood recruitment to streams and as Jack mentioned yesterday more incorporation of um, potential hydrology and, and sediment dynamics to uh, to really to combine those in, to lead to more effective riparian management with the when incorporating fire and fuels. So that's all I have and I raced through it and deleted some of my slides because I can take some questions.